Hey, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome. Sorry that we're six minutes late. That's okay. We're here and we're going to do our show. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Happy Saturday evening and away we go. Of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. Welcome, everybody. So glad to be here on Saturday night with all of you in my lovely Brooklyn apartment. I'm here and I've got plenty of unnamed water beverage and we have got got a good show ahead of us. So as I said before, please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the notifications bell. Uh, you want to make sure that you're subscribed. The YouTube algorithms have a strange habit of unsubscribing people against their wishes. So make sure that you're subscribed and make sure you're hitting that notifications bell so that you get the notifications. You want to be able to know that this program is happening. And before I jump into things, a few quick business announcements. Um, you know, uh, I'll just just a quick reminder that for some reason, uh, well, we know the reason they blocked our Thursday night stream. A two minute clip from Saturday Night Live was too much for them. They blocked our three and a half hour stream over over a two minute clip that was copyrighted. So if you want to go watch it, you can watch it. Uh, it's just on this other YouTube channel. Uh, stream number 442 live number 442 is on our other YouTube channel which is where we post uh, post uh, clips, uh, you know, from from the different broadcasts uh, by topic. So go and subscribe to our other YouTube channel. If you want to watch the Thursday night stream that was banned from YouTube, uh, we posted an edited version of it there. It's also on the Rockfin. It's also on the Rumble and it's also on the Odyssey. So there you go. There you go. Uh, then the other channel is where we have clips arranged by topic, Caleb Mop and videos. Um, and that channel just keeps getting bigger. Uh, we put, you know, the latest videos on there. We got strengths and weaknesses of Sigmund Freud. That's from last night. We got beyond kindergarten communism, deeper analysis of the capitalist crisis. That's from last night. From two nights ago, we've got San Francisco in the 70s. We've got productive versus non-productive labor, women's clothing expo in North Korea, Good stuff. It's good stuff, folks. Uh, so go subscribe to that channel uh, so that we can continue to do our thing. Couple other announcements. Couple other announcements. Um, if you want to be included in the patrons only streams uh, that we do uh, in this community, uh, sign up and become a member of the Patreon. Sign up and join on Patreon. Become a supporter of the work that we do. You can join on Patreon, and then you'll be included on the patrons-only streams. You'll get complimentary copies of the books that I write and that are published by the CPI. That's a good deal all around. So sign up on Patreon. And on top of that, we just had a great meeting this afternoon for the Center for Political Innovation. Very exciting. A lot of great projects are in the works. Uh, at this point, the Center for Political Innovation has 63 dues-paying members. So if you'd like to become involved in the activism and the, uh, the events that we put on and the efforts to educate people about socialism, if you want to join our community of solidarity, all you have to do is sign up and join. 
we had a great meeting this afternoon. We're going to be having some workshops tomorrow. Uh, you know, people that want to, you know, learn all, how to give socialist classes in their community. That's really exciting. we got a conference coming up in March. That's going to be awesome. Some other plans in the works related to the Korean Peninsula, related to, uh, to opposing imperialism. So it's going to be awesome. So if you want to be part of our community of solidarity and be included in our efforts, by all means, join the Center for Political Innovation, the CPI. Other news. Um, other news. Well, um, I got to see Garland Nixon today. Uh, that was pretty neat. Garland Nixon was in town for the Julian Assange uh, Freedom Rally at the British Embassy. Didn't go to the rally, but I did get to meet with Garland Nixon beforehand. Garland Nixon is a great friend of our community. Uh, he's spoken at CPI conferences before. I love his work. I love his various radio shows. He's a longtime broadcaster. Good friend of mine, so it was really great to sit down with Garland Nixon. That was awesome. Um, other news, other business announcements? I don't think there are any other business announcements. So, like I said before, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. The way the show works is I give my opening remarks, which are then followed by the roll call. And then, for the remainder of the show... I give answers to super chat questions. So if there's something you want me to talk about in the second half of the show, the best thing to do is send me a super chat question. I will type it on the screen in front of me. And in the second half of the show, I will answer your questions. So if you have questions you want me to answer, by all means, send me a super chat. I will type down your super chat and then I will address it in the second half of the show. may not give you the answer that you're looking for, but I will give you some kind of answer, most likely. Uh, so there you go. Uh, super chats are always appreciated. Always appreciated. So if you have something you want me to talk about in the second half of the show, send me a super chat. That's what makes the second half of the show so exciting. So here we go. I guess I'll just jump into the opening comments for tonight. Fear. 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 This is something that gets in the way of the greatest revolutionaries, the greatest potential revolutionaries. Fear. Fear is everywhere in America right now. People have been psyched up to be afraid of each other. Fear is not only keeping people from being great revolutionary activists. Fear is also keeping people from having meaningful relationships with other people. We are all psyched up to be afraid of other people. And when I think about the bad things that have happened over the course of the last decade in my personal life, all of them have fear at their root. Fears that I had, fears that other people had, anxieties, fear is one of the biggest problems that we're facing. And fear is everywhere. And so much of the propaganda pumped at us via Facebook, and Twitter, and Netflix, and Instagram, so much of that fear that is pumped at us is intended to demobilize us. You know, when you say fear, people think of horror. They think of horror movies. I would argue that horror movies are probably not 
the main place that people get their fear from. In fact, people go see horror movies because they enjoy being scared. They enjoy the emotional roller coaster. Um, they're, all, they're on some level trying to overcome their fear. So I, you know, horror movies are horror movies. And I don't particularly like modern horror movies. I don't like Saw. I don't like slasher movies. I do like the older horror movies. I like Dracula. I particularly like the films of a British studio called Hammer Film Productions uh, that made films in the 50s, 60s, and 70s starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. One of their directors was Terrence Fisher. I love those movies, and they are considered to be horror movies, but they're not horror movies in the same way modern horror movies are. They're, they're a little bit different. But honestly, I don't think horror movies make people afraid. They might make people afraid while they're watching them, but they don't contribute to people's anxiety, their, their fear in life. If anything, it kind of uh, makes people stronger. People come out of the theater, they enjoyed it, they enjoyed a good horror movie that was suspenseful, had them on the edge of their seat. They feel kind of emboldened and empowerful uh, and empowered by it. They feel kind of powerful. So I would argue that horror movies don't contribute to fear. Uh, I would argue that it's it's largely it's news media. News media really contributes to fear. It's interpersonal dramas that really contributes to fear. And honestly, comedy, modern comedy, a lot of it contributes to people's fear. And you say, Caleb, that's not true. Caleb, that can't be. Why would comedy films make me afraid? Because one of the greatest fears that people have is humiliation. And a lot of times when you're laughing, you're laughing at someone who's in a pathetic situation. You're laughing at someone who's in, in an embarrassing situation. And that's putting into your subconscious the idea that that kind of thing could happen to you. And fear of embarrassment, fear of humiliation, fear of having your weaknesses revealed is one of the greatest fears that people live with. Fear is all around us. And fear is demobilizing. When I tell people that Twitter isn't real, Facebook isn't real, Instagram isn't real, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that people don't act that way in the real world. In the real world, when you see another person, you're obligated by your mind, by your natural human instincts, even if you disagree with the person, even if you find the other person repugnant, your natural human instincts require you to give that other person who is in your presence some kind of empathy. You are forced to recognize that other person's humanity. Even if you don't like them, even if you're pumped full of hate, it's much harder to hate a person who is in your presence. It's certainly possible. But it's much harder to hate a person in your presence than it is to hate an anonymous an anonymous thing on the internet. And when people hide behind that anonymity of the internet, when people start arguing with another anonymous voice on the internet, the worst, the worst instincts of people come out. And the way people act on Twitter, and the way people act on Facebook, and the way people act on Instagram is not real because in real life, people don't act that way. In real life, people feel a certain level of basic human empathy with each other. And even when they do vicious things to each other, I mean, people murder each other, people fight with each other. Yes. But even when those things happen, they have a very different dynamic to them. The internet is this disconnected way of engaging with people. You could say it's a disembodied way of engaging with people. And it brings out the very ugly sides of the human spirit. But if you stay home all day 
and you're on the internet all day, and your only interactions with people are through this disembodied way of interacting with people, the impression that you'll get of humanity is going to be a very negative one. And the more that you're just sitting on the internet, engaging with people through the internet, the more that you're going to think that the internet is real life. And the more you think the internet is real life, the more afraid of the real life you're going to be. And the more you're going to stay home, and the more you're going to stay home, and the more you're going to stay on the internet, and it's a cycle. And it builds on itself, and it builds on itself, and it builds on itself until people become completely antisocial. Until people, people get afraid to go out of their houses. People get afraid to interact with other people. People have huge amounts of anxiety about just going out to dinner with somebody, about just going to a place where there might be actual people. This is not good. This is not good. Fear is how they control people. And it's been my ability in life to overcome fears that's gotten me where I've, I've gone. When I came to New York, I didn't know what was on the other side. I didn't know what was going to happen. But I got on a Greyhound bus and I came to New York City with almost nothing. And look where I am now. I think about some of the relationships I've been in, some of the interactions I've been in, and how fear holds you back. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what might go wrong. And fears that are pumped into all of us. Fears of connecting with other people fears of things not going well, because the reality is sometimes things don't go well. Sometimes you try something you haven't done before, and it doesn't go well. And sometimes you think, I never want to do this again. But other times, you try something for the first time, it doesn't go so well, but there was something about it you liked. So then... You try it again, and you learn from what went wrong the first time, and it goes a little bit better that time. And then you try it again, and it goes a little bit better. And you try it again, and it goes even more better. And eventually, that thing that you didn't do so well the first time, you can actually do it pretty darn well. That's a thing that happens. There's a quote in the Little Red Book by Mao Zedong. Mao writes, and he's actually, he, he's not the author of this quotation. He says it's a, a widely used Chinese proverb. He who does not fear death by a thousand cuts dares to unhorse the emperor. Let me repeat that. He who does not fear death by a thousand cuts dares to unhorse the emperor. And that was an expression in China about how when people are not held back by fear, they're able to do almost impossible things. It gives them a huge amount of power when they are not held back by fear. You got to think, you know, these people, these people that could be doing something. Thank you, Gala. Jordan. Writing it down. These people that could be doing something. These people that could be playing a bigger role in the revolutionary movement. These people who could become part of a real 
socialist community of solidarity. These people who could make more friends, make real connections. These people who could do these things if they overcame their fears. You got to think about them. You got to think about them for a moment. Because in the moment, the anxiety that you feel about going to this event, the anxiety that you feel about being friends with this person, the anxiety you feel about what if somebody doesn't like me, the anxiety you feel about what if this doesn't go well, what if this doesn't turn out to be as good as I thought it was. That anxiety can feel very, very intense at times, right? Especially when you're on the brink of doing something for the first time. It can feel very, very intense. But that moment passes. And you go and do what you were anxious to do. And either it turns out to be bad, and then you stop, and you don't do it again, or, or you do it differently. Or you go and do it and you had a good time. And that's it. And it's over. And you tried it. That thing you were afraid to do, you tried to do it. And it either went well or it didn't. And if it went well, you won out. If it didn't, you learned something. You'll either do it differently next time or you won't do it. You know, you learn. But that's it. It's done. It's over. However, if you don't do it, if you get into the habit of not doing things, if you say no over and over and over again, and you don't do it, 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 and this continues year after year after year after year, and you don't do it, and you don't do it, and you don't do it, Pretty soon, you're going to be in a situation where you're not happy with your life. And you're going to be disappointed. And you're going to sit there and say, why didn't I? I could have. I should have. But I, why didn't I just? And that feeling that you'll have after years of never overcoming your anxiety. That feeling that you'll have after years of letting yourself get in your own way, that feeling will not be temporary. That feeling will be quite permanent. It'll be quite hard to undo. It'll be quite hard to undo that. worth thinking about. And the first time you stop yourself from doing something that you want to do because you're nervous about it, because you have anxiety about it, the first time you do that, it might be 50-50. But then the next opportunity you get, you're going to be even more afraid. And then the next opportunity you get, you're going to be even more afraid. And it's going to be harder and harder and harder to do what you want to do. It's going to be harder to do it. Each time you say no, it gets harder to do it next time. But each time you say yes, it gets easier to do it. And so the more no, 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 the more you isolate and isolate and isolate and isolate, the more that you're interacting with the world through a computer screen. The more that your anxieties prevent you from going and connecting with other people or trying things you haven't done, the worse things get. Fear is like a snowball that's rolling down a hill and picking up more and more and more and more and more snow 
starts out at the top of the hill. It's a small snowball. By the time it rolls to the bottom of the hill, it's picked up so much snowball. It's a huge snowball. That's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. But if you can learn to push back against the fear, if you can learn to say, I want to do something, I have anxieties about doing it, but I'm going to give it a try. And if I don't like it, well, I won't do it again. But if I do like it, I'll know I like it. And then I can do it again and again and again. If. If. You can get yourself in that situation. It will get easier and easier and easier. And easier to do different things. And this is what people really need to understand, that isolation, social isolation, social anxiety, depression, hopelessness, all of these things are like, they are like, I'm trying to think of a good expression. They, they are exponential. No, that's not a good way of talking about it. They're not exponential. They're self-replicating. That's how I'll put it. They are self-replicating. And they build 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 and they build. And you know, sometimes when things happen and they go badly, right? When you're sitting there saying, should I or should I not? You're thinking about the possible consequences. You're, you're envisioning in your mind the worst case scenario of what might happen if you do it and how badly it might go if you actually do it. The chances are that worst case scenario won't happen. But if it did, if it did, if that worst case scenario did indeed happen, In a way, you would grow from that. And that worst case scenario that you experience, the next time something like that worst case scenario happened to you, it wouldn't bother you as much because you'd been through it once. First time I got arrested at a demonstration, it was quite unnerving. I'd never been arrested before. After that, the next time I got arrested, not a big deal. I mean, it was certainly a big deal, and getting arrested is a big deal, but it wasn't as big of a, an anxiety-provoking situation as it was the first time, because I knew what was going to happen. I'd been arrested before. There's other examples of this you can give. So even if the worst-case scenario plays out, you will be more immune from that worst-case scenario than you were before. And in a way, if your worst fear comes true, if the very thing, the very thing that you were afraid of happens, if your worst fear manifests itself and comes out of your nightmare into reality, in a day or two, you'll have adjusted. And you will have, in a way, Overcome your worst fear. Did you know this? You will have, in a way, overcome your worst fear by experiencing it. Your worst fear, your worst nightmare, the worst case scenario will have happened. You will have gotten through it if you don't die. And then you will come out of that situation having lived through your worst fear, having experienced it, having come out the other side, and then you won't be as afraid of your worst fear. Your worst fear will be deflated by you experiencing it. So even, even in that worst case scenario, you still come out the winner. Something to think about. 
right? One, one thing that people often do is they catastrophize. All right, this is a really, really common thing that I see from people is that something bad happens or they're afraid that something bad is going to happen, but they take this bad thing that happened or they take this bad thing that might happen and then they say, well, what if because of this, this happens? And they think of something else to have anxiety about. And then they say, and then what if because of this, this happens? And then they're having even more anxiety. And what if because of this, this happens? And pretty soon they are so worked up and upset about things that haven't even happened. Whatever the real danger was whatever the real bad thing that happened to them was, whatever it was, they are completely out of touch with reality and worked up about a scenario that isn't real. This is a really, really common, common cognitive distortion. This is how that fear builds on itself. People learn to think this way, to creatively make their fears and anxieties compound on themselves, to catastrophize. It's a really common, common distortion of reality that people engage in. Where they say, well, this is going to mean this, right? So it's like, say, all right. Say someone has a, a fear of being arrested. They say, this might happen and I could get arrested. Okay. And they say, and if I get arrested, I might lose my job. And if I might lose my job, I might not be able to find another job. And if I don't have a job, I won't be able to eat. And if I'm not able to eat, I will starve on the street. And, and if I starve on the street, and it's like, whoa, we've gone from, you might get arrested to, you know, you're, you're starving on the street and dying. You haven't gotten arrested unless you're trying to get arrested, unless you're like intentionally provoking arrest. There's no guarantee you're going to get arrested. There's no guarantee you're going to lose your job if you get arrested. There's no guarantee that if you lose your job, you won't be able to find another job. There's no guarantee that just because you don't have a job, you won't qualify for food stamps and you won't get food. There are many, 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 many leaps you just made. And so someone's sitting there fearing they might get arrested and they've turned that into, oh my God, I'm going to be starving on the street. And they're, they're not in touch with reality. You know, if there's a danger of being arrested, you may want to calculate that risk. You may want to think, oh, maybe I should or shouldn't do this. Maybe I should operate in a way. Maybe what is the danger of a potential arrest? But you don't want to catastrophize. You want to be in touch with reality. You know, it's really, really funny. When I was in high school, I had to take health class. We all had to take health class. And I hated health class. Why did I hate health class? Because we did not learn about anatomy. We did not learn about exercising or eating healthy. It was two years of don't have sex and don't do drugs. And it was just two years of don't have sex and don't do drugs. And I hated it. It was a moralizing you know, and I, I grew up in a very religious small town. And so they're just, it was just two years of once a day getting preached at by very religious people about why one should not have sex and one should not use drugs. And it was obnoxious, you know, and it's like, you know, I mean, I would have been interested in human anatomy. I would have been interested in eating properly or, you know, being healthy. But instead, I got two years of don't have sex and don't do drugs. And it was not not entertaining, uh, to say the least. But one thing that I remember that is rather amusing was that in the health class um, that I was in, and this shows you how my mind has always worked. There's always been something about me that is just, I don't know. I don't know what the word is, but 
you know, they had various posters, posters in the classroom, you know, about the dangers of cigarettes, the dangers of alcohol, the dangers of STDs and teen pregnancies. They had one poster, one poster that hung on on the, the school wall. And it said, what single moment could be worth a life sentence? And I would always look at that. What single moment could be worth a life sentence? And in my mind, I would imagine like the end of Braveheart, the movie with Mel Gibson, where he's like being executed and he's like, freedom, right? Or I would think about, you know, Jesus Christ being nailed to a cross. Or I would think about like great revolutionary leaders who were killed in battle. And I would see that poster. And I thought that poster was about, about, you know, being heroic, right? What, what, what cause could be so good that you would want to die for it? What, what, what would you want? I thought it was about martyrdom. That's what I saw in the poster, right? I, I thought the poster was about martyrdom. What single moment could be worth a life sentence? I thought about like, find a cause, find something that you're willing to, to die for and sacrifice for. And I found out that's actually not what the poster was intended to say. That's not what it actually said. It was intended to make you not get into the car when someone's drunk driving. It was intended to make you not have sex with your boyfriend and get pregnant out of wedlock, right? That's what it was intended to say. It was like, you know, there's no moment of pleasure, no moment of fun. If it'll ruin your whole life, kid. that's what it was meant to say. But that's just not how my mind worked. That's just not how I understood things. Right? I saw this poster and it said, what single moment could be worth a, a life sentence? And I saw that and I thought martyrdom and sacrifice and and heroism. And I mean, I looked at that. I looked at that and I, I, I completely took it the wrong way. I got the exact opposite message from the poster. Um, and maybe I revealed too much about myself. That's the exact opposite message that that you were supposed to get from the poster but you know i think about how i i read the poster wrong i misinterpreted the poster right what single moment could be worth a life sentence and i thought i just completely misinterpreted the poster but i think about that folks and i smile because the part of my mind that misinterpreted that poster The part of my mind that read that poster wrong, that is the part of my mind that has gotten me where I am today. I would never, I would never have gotten from a tiny little hillbilly redneck town in Ohio to Cleveland. I would have never gotten from Cleveland to New York. I would have never gotten from New York to Iran. I would have never gotten from Iran to the Gulf of Aden, I never would have gotten from, from, from there to Africa. I never would have gotten to be on Russian television. I never would have gotten to found the Center for Political Innovation. I never would have gotten to write huge books about Marxism if I didn't have that. That strange mindset that views the world to some degree or other as an adventure that views things almost as a challenge. So I just wanted to share that with you all, give you all something to think about. Because a lot of people have suffered and a lot of people have been hurt. A lot of people have sacrificed over the years and said, was it really all worth it? Was it really all worth it? There's a lot of people who have regrets. They took risks. They made decisions they wish they had not made. But I'll tell you one thing. There are far more people, far, far, far more people 
who regret giving in to their fears. And not living up to their potential and not taking risks and not making sacrifices and not putting themselves into exciting circumstances. There are far more people who regret that than there are people who regret having done it and having it go wrong. Now, there's no reason for people to be stupid. There's no reason for people to engage in left adventurist or illegal activities. There's no reason for people to martyr themselves just for just just for the purpose of feeling heroic. We're we're not into that. That's a petty bourgeois deviation. That's a petty bourgeois deviation, right? We're not into people people trying to get themselves persecuted so they can feel like heroes and feel proud of themselves. We're not into that nonsense. We don't appreciate that kind of behavior, right? This isn't about making ourselves feel good about ourselves. This is about getting things done and achieving the ends that we want to achieve. That is ultimately what it's all about, right? That's that's what it comes down to. The personal subjective experience should not be the primary goal. The primary goal should be to achieve the objective ends. No question about it. But if you're asking yourself, should I? Should I take on a little bit of risk? Should I step out of my apartment and connect with people in real life? Should I join a community? Should I meet a new group of people? Should I, should I associate with people that are controversial? Should I put myself into history and insert my will upon human history? You're far more likely to regret not doing it than you are to regret doing it. Baristas aren't working class. And you comment on the whole baristas aren't working class talking when it's been circulating infrared. I'm curious if there's an actual Marxist origin. All righty. That's what I just wanted to say. Um, I just wanted to, to comment on all of that and encourage people not to be paralyzed by their own fears. Not to be paralyzed by their own fears. And since, since a lot of this was just kind of personal, self-helpy, I'll relate it to politics. I'll relate it to politics before I end my opening remarks. If you read What is to be Done, which is Vladimir Lenin's uh, his quintessential key work, What is to be Done, Vladimir Lenin was responding to a trend that existed in society, and in the Marxist movement. Thank you very much. There was a trend that existed in the Marxist movement at the time. Karl Kautsky, Plekhanov, a trend that argued that it would just kind of happen historical inevitability that capitalism will just kind of naturally turn into socialism. Just like feudalism just kind of naturally turned into capitalism, just like slavery just kind of naturally turned into feudalism. You know, it'll just kind of naturally happen. Look, the workers are forming unions. 
And those unions are going on strike. And in Europe, they've got social democratic parties. And it's just kind of sort of naturally going to happen. Just going to naturally happen. Just sort of going to naturally happen. That was the that was the argument. And what Lenin was saying in what is to be done, if you read it, he was very clearly saying, no, it is not just going to naturally happen. He said that the working class left to their own devices without the intervention of conscious revolutionary forces, without revolutionary theory, there is no revolutionary movement. And no, no, it's not just going to naturally kind of sort of happen. We have to decide to intervene. We have to, we have to decide to intervene and make it happen. No, it's not just going to sort of naturally happen. And that's what anarchists attack Lenin for saying. He said the working class left to their own devices will only ever develop trade union consciousness. The working class left to their own devices will only ever re- you know, develop trade union consciousness. And that's true. And that he criticized what was called tailism. When there would be a strike in Russia, the strike would happen. The communists would run to the strike and say, wow, we support your strike and we're communists. They would tail after what already happened. They weren't making strikes happen. They weren't making uprisings happen. Uprisings would spontaneously happen, and then they would chase after them, bowing to spontaneity, tailism. Lenin said, that's not going to work. And they said, no, it's a great thing that happens. These workers, when they go on strike, this is an economic struggle. But we show up, and we're a political party, so we are lending the economic struggle, a political character. And Lenin says, yeah, yeah, that's funny. That's, that's great. Great. Go, go have a cookie. You lent the political part struggle. You lent the economic struggle, a political, uh, a political character, go have a cookie. That's worthless. Lenin said the role of the Vanguard party is instead to be the tribune of the people. And to not just assume it's going to naturally happen, but to find the sentiments among the masses that are already there and give expression to them. And escalate them. And transform the day-to-day struggles into a struggle against the entire system. And it was Bolshevism that said, no, we must insert ourselves into history. What is to be done? The whole point of the book is we got to do it. It's not just going to naturally happen. We got to get serious so we can win this thing. There were similar decisions made in the Chinese Revolution, and I talk about these things. But when people get into that relaxed state of mind. People get into that mode where revolutionary politics is just kind of a form of entertainment. 
They're missing the point. They're missing the point. And I will say another thing that I've often said to people. I'll just put it this way. Don't read Marx. Don't read Marx. Do not read Marx. Why? Because unless you are involved in a revolutionary struggle, you don't get it. If you're not involved in trying to build a socialist organization or a socialist movement, you are not part of a community of activists. If you read Marx all on your own, you just open it up and you read it, it doesn't mean shit to you. And it's not gonna, it, it's not gonna make sense. You're not gonna get it. Not gonna get it. But if you're involved in a revolutionary struggle, if you're in an organization, if people are depending on you, if there are disagreements within that organization about how they should function, if you're actively working with other people to try and insert yourself into history, when you read Marx, it's going to have way more of a meaning. It's going to be almost like you read it with magical glasses on. It's going to strike you in a completely different way. Marx, Lenin, Mao, Stalin, this stuff is not meant to be read in the abstract. And if you read it in the abstract, it's not going to make any sense to you. If you read it in the abstract, it's going to seem strange. It's going to seem odd. It's going to seem like highfalutin gibberish. But if you read Marx... You read Lenin, you read Stalin, you read Mao, you read Fidel Castro's writings. You, you read these things in the context of a living struggle, in the process of building a revolutionary organization, of having comrades, of being in a community that's actually trying to accomplish something. It's going to strike you in a completely different manner. It's going to mean something completely different to you. And if you are just on your own, if you're just, you know, just out there on your own, I don't, I, I would say don't read Marx. Don't read Angles. Thanks for the reminder, David. Don't read it because you don't get it. And that's why academia, the way they talk about Marx and Engels is so queer. It is so queer. You know, I appreciate Richard Wolff. I appreciate, um, I appreciate some of the work of Michael Hudson. Uh, but you know, I, I I listen to David Harvey and the way he talks about Marx, it's like he's talking about literature. He's like, oh, I read Karl Marx with a group of Shakespeare students and they thought about it this way. And then I read Karl Marx with a group of architects and it struck them this way. And then I read Karl Marx with a group of medical students and it struck them this way. And if you look at the phrases that Karl Marx uses, it's kind of iambic pentameter. He doesn't get it. He does not get it. David Harvey doesn't get it. You know, I, I always thought that Marx sounded a little bit kind of like I was reading something uh, that was written in, in a period like the 1800s. Um, I've noticed that Marx uses prepositions more than he uses nouns and verbs. It, it's, 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 he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get it because... If you're not connected to a living struggle, if you're not actively building a revolutionary organization, if you're not living out these ideas, it's gobbledygook. There's better books to read. If you're just looking for books to read, don't read Marx. Read a book. Go read Go read uh, James Bond. Go read Sean Connery. Or not Sean Connery. Ian Fleming. Go read Ian Fleming. And thank you, Combate. Go read Ian Fleming. Um you know, go read, go read Ian Fleming, you know, diamonds are forever. Uh, you know, um, uh, you only live twice. You know, that's, that's, that's much more exciting than reading Marx. If, if Marx, Marx is meant to be read in the context of struggle. It is not meant to be read in the abstract. And the reason that every college, not every college, many colleges offers, offer courses on Marxism and young people take those courses and hate them. This happened at my college. They had a course on Marxism in the philosophy department. I was an actual Marxist and I took it and I was like, this is crap, right? There's a reason people take these courses and don't get anything out of them.
Um, there's a lot of pe reason people take these courses and they don't get anything out of them. Because what they're taking, uh, the, what they're reading, they don't have any place to apply it. And everything that Karl Marx wrote was written in the context of struggle, and it was meant to be read by people who were engaging in struggle. You know, if you've never been on the ocean, you've never been on a boat, and somebody handed you a manual for sailing, you wouldn't make heads or tails of it. I mean, you might be able to read it, but it, it wouldn't be any, very interesting to you, number one. And number two, you wouldn't exactly get it because you'd be like, okay, so, uh, you know, when I'm on the ocean, I do this. But if you're a sea captain, if you're in the Navy, if it, it makes a lot more sense. And that's my point. And that's how I'll end my opening remarks for tonight. Just kind of a, you know, just a few thoughts that were on my mind, I'm sitting in the bathtub of a couple hours ago, thinking about all the fear that's floating around our society and all the people I know who are crippled by fear. And uh, I just wanted to get that out there. So names and locations, names and locations. I will call you out as I see you. Names and locations, names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Who's with us tonight? Names and locations. Names and locations. Who's with us? We got Cleveland Pirate Alex. We got Rupert Fellows. We got Ben Du from Delaware. Great, great conversation we had. Bendigo, Australia. David Fox. Christina in Portland. Rice from Adelaide, Australia. Caracas, Venezuela. Jose Gonzalez. We got Jenny Lynn in Cincinnati. We got Uzbekistan. Ash Rivers. We got Tristan in Maryland. We got... We got Jim in Harrisburg. We got Ash Rivers. We got St. George, Utah, Preston, uh, Ryan Preston. We got Chester in England. We got Grady in Calif uh, California. We got Nate in Chicago. We got in the crosshairs of history. We got uh, Karek in Florida, Dirty South. Uh, isn't it the north of Florida, like the panhandle that's dirty? Uh, we got Bob Troy. Uh, we got uh, Kieran from San Diego, and thank you for the super chat. We got Edward from uh, Edward Allen from Kentucky, Danny in Boston, Oklahoma City, Laura Spencer. Who will win the World Cup, says Ash Rivers. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. No, no idea. We got Alex in Kingston. Shout out to you, Alex. We got Alex from Brazil. We got Jared from Virginia. We got Heidi in Edinburgh. We got Jim from Harrisburg. We got St. David's Bermuda. We got Humble, Texas, right? Catalonia, Spain, Dublin, Ireland. Very, very, very good. Very, very, very good. Very, very, very good. We got Tyler in Missouri. We got our friend Kinky is with us. Always a pleasure to have Kinky on here. We got Morocco. Hi, Kinky. Anyone else? Names and location. Yada Yisrael. I.O. Hillary in NYC. Shout out to you. The Netherlands. Very, very, very good. Very, very, very good. Very, very good. Anyone else? Names and locations? Or should we start answering these super chats? Uh, Killian from Milwaukee. No, that's not what I meant. Sorry for your lost thrill. All right, very good. I will start answering super chats then. Um, first super chat is that Jordan Peele makes good horror movies. I what horror movies has Jordan Peele made? I am not familiar with his work. Uh, what what horror movies does Jordan Peele make? What is he the director of? I'm gonna have to Google this. Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele. And that's from Gala. Jordan Peele is an actor. Right, uh, an actor and filmmaker. Okay, and um, oh, wasn't he part of the Kai and Peele comedy duo? Right, right. So, what movies has he made? Um, Get Out, um, The Last OG. No, that's a comedy thing. Oh, Candyman. Okay, well, I'll have to check out Jordan Peele's horror movies. I'll have to check them out. I haven't seen them, so there you go. All right. Comment on the baristas aren't working class comment. It's been circulating around infrared. My, I, I, you know, honestly, I'm not paying that much attention to infrared these days. I mean, ever since all the drama, it's just like, you know, why bother? You know, 
Um, but, uh, you know, my, I guess my understanding of what they were saying, I assume is that they were distinguishing between productive labor and non-productive labor. And they, they were arguing that one is not, one is not a worker unless you put surplus value into a product. Um, right. If you work in a factory, uh, you know, the, the profits that the capitalist makes from the products of that factory, are from your labor. It's surplus value that comes out of your labor. Um, if you're not working in a factory, if you're doing a service job, right, you're still a wage worker, you're still being paid a wage, but you're not engaged in what Marx called productive labor. And the percentage of the working class that engage in productive labor is always decreasing because of technology. Um, and that's one thing that's constantly happening. Um, because of capitalism, the amount of people involved in productive labor is constantly going down. And this is a big point that actually Lynn Marcus makes in, you know, it's Lyndon LaRouche's pen name when he was still calling himself a Marxist, makes in dialectical economy. So I assume that that's what they're arguing. They're, they're saying that because the barista, you know, the barista is not involved at the point of production. They're not a factory worker. But you could argue that, the you know, I mean, they make the coffee, right? I mean, if, if I mean, they make that coffee, right? It would just be beans and water without the barista, right? That's a barista makes coffee. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly what they're getting at, but I assume that they're arguing that that value is created at the point of production. And if you are serving coffee, if you're a waiter who brings people food, um, you know, um, I think that's the argument. You know, he, his main criticism of leftists who celebrate barista unions is a win for the working class to cover their failure of reaching the actual working class. Well, that's fair. I mean, I, I get what they're saying, right? That barista is more of a hipster job, right? That in these in these uh, gentrified urban centers, these young 20 year olds are baristas, right? And that, you know, we should be unionizing Walmart. We should be unionizing. But a lot of, you know, a lot of the jobs that people do in the broad masses of people are service sector jobs. Walmart, that's a service sector job. Right. Uh, you know, if somebody works at Home Depot, um, you know, Uber drivers. Right. That's a service sector job. You're performing a service. Right. So, you know, I, I, I think it's a little bit confused. I get he's mo I guess what Ryan is telling me is that he's mocking the the fact that the left is sticking in their hipster, middle class, gentrified urban neighborhood safe spaces. That's what he's getting at. OK, well. I mean, that's a fair criticism, but that's not the same as saying they're not workers. There is a, dis a, a distinguishing between productive labor and non-productive labor. That is that is a Marxist point. And maybe he's like confusing that point with another point or something like that. But, you know, whatever. And I'm sure someone's going to clip this and run to Haas and be like, oh, my God, Haas, Caleb was talking smack about you. Oh, my God. He said that you're stupid. Oh, what are you going to do about it? You know, that's how this Internet garbage works. You know what I mean? Somebody does that, you know, Haas, I, I, I'm not following your streams. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to fight with you. So please, you know, people like seriously, we got, we, again, the whole opening remark was about building a real movement, right? And if your goal is to get me to rumble with Haas and fight with Haas, you know, you're not, uh, you're not, um, what's the point? You're not being productive. That's non-productive activity that you're engaging in. So, you know, I like Haas. He's anti-imperialist. Uh, you know, he sports anti-imperialist states. Very different approach than I have. I wish him the best, and I don't want to fight with Haas. So please don't try to set up a fight between me and Haas to entertain yourself. Not a productive thing to do. But I assume that that's what he was getting at. Um, and then Ryan said it was something else. So I, no comment. All righty. All right. Next question. Please keep the super chats rolling in. We got a few more, but that's the whole second half of the show is you guys. It's me answering your questions. So more questions, the better. Um, Harvard Law students said that their mental health program includes finger painting. What is the end result of this? Let me ask, what does that mean? I, I, I hear that, right? And I immediately get like a caricature of like a safe space and adults being infantilized. But like, what does that actually mean? Like, does that mean that in, you know, when students at Harvard are studying psychology and they're learning about mental health, they do some kind of activity that involves finger painting that is in their psychology classes to learn something about mental health? Is that what it means? Uh, does it mean that 
college age students are going to some kind of therapy program to deal with their own psychological issues or anxieties they have or childhood trauma and it involves finger painting and there's some is that what that means uh like what does that mean right i mean you just i i, I have to know the context of this i mean finger painting is an activity they do for very very small children generally um right that's what it is generally um so you know on the surface i'm hearing that and saying well that's infantilizing and i'm thinking about my own college experience and how the college that i went to was a piece of crap college that you know was a big waste of money and it was very infantilizing uh very infantilizing and i felt like you know i mean i'm a legal adult here in college and they were treating us like we were three and there was all of these you know, we're all going to sit in a circle and talk about our feelings. If you hear me clap once, if you hear me clap twice, endless amount of that infantilizing bullshit. So if that's what you're getting to, uh, maybe that's what you're getting at there. Um, and ultimately, yeah, there is an element of trying to reduce adults to childlike behaviors because then they're easier to control, right? That is... There's some of that that goes on, right? There's, you know, if you infantilize people, they feel weaker. Uh, they're more likely to obey authority and not disagree. Uh, they're going to crave the approval. Yeah, that 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 infantilization is a mechanism for, uh, you know, maintaining psychological control over people, right? I would argue. And that's why one one thing, we do not do that in CPI. We will never do that in CPI. The day that we do infantilizing woke shops is the day I quit CPI permanently because, you know, I mean, there will be no woke, none of that, right? We're not all going to sit in a circle and talk about our favorite pizza. Um, you know, I mean, you know, if people in CPI start talking like they're two years old, uh, I'm out of there. I'm out of there. So, I mean, maybe that's what you're getting at with your question there is you're getting at the infantilizing environment that we all get from things. Um, but there you go. Um, what does it mean to reject woke politics? Good. That's a good question. What does it mean to reject woke politics? It means actually studying Marxism. It means actually studying Marxism. And at no point, don't give them an inch. Do not give them an inch. Do not give them an inch. It means if you have a study group about Marxism, you read books about Marxism. And if somebody comes in and they're like, why are we always reading books about like old white men? Like, why don't we read books about like transgender Puerto Ricans and how they're being oppressed by Vladimir Putin and their voices are like being silenced and how we need to empower the non-heteronormative? You can say, well, you know, we can read black revolutionaries. We can read Gaddafi. We can read Angela Davis, Huey Newton, Asada Shakur. There's plenty of black revolutionaries. We can read Rosa Luxemburg, plenty of women revolutionaries. But if you want us to sit around and have a conversation about like cisgender privilege and the heteronormative uh, experience of like, you know, you just say, no, we don't do that shit here. And we don't pander to that shit. And we don't try to make people that are into that shit happy. We make clear what we're doing here is something different. We're against racism. We're against gender oppression. We're against any form of exploitation. But we're not going to no. this idea that we're we have to like do this college thing, this this academic where we're all we're going to sit here and talk about like how like like white men are like erasing the voices of transgender lesbians uh, who are fighting against, uh, you know, you know, no, no, no. You just got to reject that. And, you know, you, you know it when you see it, you know, this crap when you hear it, you know it. We all know this crap as soon as we hear it. And like, you know, I, I felt erased at the last meeting because John was like totally mansplaining because I asked him who Lenin was and and he told me and like he made me feel like I didn't know. And so I felt like condescended to. So like, let's all like sit in a circle and talk about why John is a bad person for telling me who Lenin was when I asked. It's like, shut up, please shut up. Trust me, folks. I tried my hardest. I tried my hardest to negotiate with this stuff, to compromise with this stuff. And I, I can't, you can't, there is no compromise with this stuff. No matter how much you go into it, this stuff will destroy you. 
if you bring this stuff into a Marxist group, into a revolutionary organization, I mean, it's like drinking, drinking poison, right? Maybe it doesn't kill you immediately, but it eventually, eventually kills you. Not trying to create drama with Haas. I know you're good. I just had to get that out there so that somebody doesn't clip it. You know, um, yeah, you know, okay. Yeah, whatever, you know, but I just, I have to put that out there because people do that. There's a huge effort. There are a lot of people who do nothing but try to get internet personalities to fight with each other, right? There are, there are a lot of people who this is their entertainment is getting internet personalities to turn on each other, getting internet personalities to have drama with each other. And there's been a huge amount of, of effort to get that kind of thing going between me and Haas. We were on, we, I'm not really paying attention to him very much, uh, these days. He's not paying much attention to me and that's fine, but like, please don't try to, you know, I just have to put that out there. So there you go. All right. Hamiltonian versus Jeffersonian worldview. Very good. That I can mention. All right. Uh, very good question. But let me let me finish this no compromise with wokeness thing. Like you cannot compromise with this. You can't. You can't. The second you try start trying to please people that are into this garbage, the second you start trying to make them happy, you've already lost because it's never enough. You know, and I, I sat and I kept my mouth shut and I sat in rooms listening to this crap for years. I will never forget being in the same room. This was an argument I had to listen to. And I knew, I knew not to argue. I knew the second someone comes at you with this woke crap, surrender. When I was in the Workers' World Party, when people came at you with this woke crap, I knew you just surrender. You can't win. So you just throw your arms up and say, oh, wow, I didn't know. And you surrender. But I watched a new member of the organization who quit shortly afterwards. He had made signs for our May 1st demonstration with the faces of various revolutionaries, Mao, Huey Newton, um, Asada Shakur, you know, revolutionaries from the oppressed world. He had made signs and below it, there was the hashtag be political. He had brought these signs to the office. This transgender man ran up to him and started yelling at him that those signs were offensive because black people and trans people just existing is political. So who does he think he is to tell black and trans people to be political? I, you know, and I sat through this argument. Did I miss a super chat from Tyler? Did I miss your super chat? Let me scroll up. Where did I, did I miss a super chat from Tyler? But I sat through this and I was just like, are you serious? I got Ryan. Did I miss a super chat from Tyler? Did I miss it? What? Oh, I did. There we go. Did Lennon... Okay, that I can talk about. Very good. Thank you, Tyler. Almost missed it. And, um, but yeah, I sat through this argument and I'm sitting there and I knew that if this, this person came at you, you just had to go, oh, wow, I didn't know. You just had to surrender immediately. I knew that, that there was no point in arguing with this person. But I was watching this guy who I'd recruited endure this, Oh my God, how dare you, you know, put be political on a sign because black people and women and trans people just existing as political. And that's so offensive. You're telling, I listened to this and I listened to him try to defend himself. And I was just like, you know, you're good. I listened to him try to defend himself and I was just like, oh my God, oh my God. Oh my God. You know, uh, it was, it was something awful. It was really, really something awful. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I just, you can't compromise with this stuff. No matter what you do, you can find some woke crap to attack somebody. You can, no matter who they are, no matter what the issue is, you can find some woke crap. Seriously. And the dumber the person is, the thing is, you would think if someone's someone's arguing against you or trying to build a case against you, if they're stupid, it would help you, right? Because they're stupid and, you, you know, they're not very smart. No, the stupider they are, the more stupid crap they can think of. Um, you know, I made a sign once that said the Syrian rebels are terrorist murderers. This same person came at me. And told me that that was really offensive. I was calling Middle Eastern people terrorists. And I said, well, that's the position, you know, we take. He's like, we support Assad? And I was just like, yeah. He didn't know our international positions. And I'm thinking, why is somebody who doesn't even know the party's international positions, why do they have veto power over everything we do? That was one thing I was constantly wondering about. Why are the most, the least political people, these woke loudmouths, these woke bullies, why do they have all the power, right? When I say I want something, they go, that's nice, Caleb. Oh, you know, when it, when it, but, but these wokes who don't believe in communism, don't know the party's international positions, don't know anything about Marxism, they have the ability to start a woke witch hunt against anybody and everyone just goes, oh, oh we're sorry, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, it's it's just it's just horrifying. You cannot compromise the second anyone comes at you with that stuff. You just have to just. You know, because you're not allowed to be a Marxist, that's what wokeism is about. It is about you're, you can't be woke and a Marxist. Wokeism is intended to destroy Marxism. It was created by the CIA, the synthetic left, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. It was created. It's anti-populist. It's anti-working class. And it was created for the purpose of preventing a real socialist movement. So the second that you welcome that crap into your space, the second that you treat it like it's real, you've already lost, you know? And, and this... I'm glad to answer this question. I'm taking a little while longer to answer this question because this this drives the people in CPUSA that are, that have their you know their heads you know that that have a stick up their butt about me. It drives them crazy because because they know most of the people who join CPUSA agree with me. They know that and that that you know Taryn Fivik is the queen of woke you know woke crap right. She Jimmy Dore insulted AOC. She's a woman of color and he's a white man. I hate him. You know she is the queen of this shit. Right. You know, you know, she is the queen of this kind of crap. You know what I mean? Wokeism is an enemy of the working class. It is. And it's a way that, you know, that non-communists and pro-imperialist elements maintain control over what should be revolutionary organizations. And they do this. Um, and it's a way that they marginalize and and bully people who actually believe in communism. Uh, and it is it is. It involves a lot of brainwashing, a lot of, you know, infantilism where they, they reduce adults to acting like they're three, right? You know, you know, they, they try to reduce adults to acting like they're three years old. They do these like sensitivity workshops where it's like we all, you know, finger paint or whatever you want to call it. And it's, it's garbage, right? You know, I can disagree with Trotskyism, but I'll say, you know, Trotsky was not woke. You know, I can disagree with ultra Maoist groups that take positions on the Soviet Union and Cuba that I don't agree with, but they're not woke. Right. And, you know, it's like if someone's a communist and they disagree with me, I can talk to them when they're woke. You just have to go. Bye bye. Bye bye. You know, if someone feels they're being mistreated. They have like a legit concern. They feel like, you know, I wasn't being treated properly. You know, I feel like this person isn't treating me properly because of my race or because of my gender. That's a different thing, right? That's something you should take very seriously. You should respect. But when people start in with the, you know, you just have to, it's really interesting. There's a book called, um, called Threat of Greatest Magnitude. It's a study of how the Revolutionary Communist Party, the RCP, the Maoist Communist Group, was infiltrated by the FBI. And apparently there was a guy on the National Committee of the RCP named Don H. Wright. 
Don H. Wright. And Don H. Wright was an FBI agent. Uh, and he was an FBI informant. And he was woke. And he was constantly accusing the party of being racist, constantly, you know, read read the history. Go read Aaron Leonard's book, Threat of Greatest Magnitude. That one of the ways they the FBI tried to undermine the Revolutionary Communist Party was with wokeism. This was back in the 70s. Another example. The 1950s. The Communist Party USA was like forced underground. They were barely functioning. They were barely functioning. But while they were barely functioning, the FBI agents that were in the organization fomented a a witch hunt for for race prejudice and racism in the party. Right? I mean, these are people that are like going to jail, that are aligning with the Soviet Union, that are like, you know, promoting, you know, taking William L. Patterson's work. I mean, like the only thing the Communist Party did practically in the 50s was promote anti-racist struggles. It was a really that was like the focus of their work. But when the FBI infiltrated the Communist Party in the 50s, they fomented a, an anti-racist, you know, purge and all kinds of people that were kicked out of the Communist Party for being racist. And they didn't know why they were being kicked out. Like, there was a lot of stuff like that that went on. Uh, you read the COINTELPRO papers and such. There was a lot of stuff that was going on. One example, the writer Howard Fast, very famous novelist who joined the Communist Party, in his autobiography, which is called Being Red, he talks about how he was almost expelled from the Communist Party. He was almost expelled from the organization because he wrote an article about a civil rights protest. And in the article, he described how there were whole families who came to the civil rights protest. And he said, little black boys and little black girls. And he was threatened with expulsion from the party for writing that article because they said one can never refer to a person of color as a boy or girl. The only word that one can use for a person of color who is not an adolescent, who is prepubescent, is youth. Because they said it is a racial slur. And they almost expelled him for it. Well, now we know that that was coming from the FBI. That there were FBI agents and informants in the organization that were whipping up that kind of hysteria. Now, there's an importance for sensitivity, obviously, you know, and, and, and it would make sense for the editors of the Daily Worker or whatever to, to change the article, you know, to edit it. And they say, well, our editorial line, and that happens all the time, right? You know, if you're in a newspaper and, you know, you change things, right? I mean, you know, it makes sense for the editors of the Daily Worker to say, well, our policy, we don't say little black boy or little black girl, we say youth. Fine. But the fact that they like, almost expelled him from the party for this. Well, that came from the FBI, and we now know that. And that the Communist Party was constantly engaging in very strange activities. If you read Black Radical by Nelson Peary, he describes this, how they were protesting Sears. Right? Sears was a store, and, you know, it's a department store in Cleveland, uh, you know, and it has stores all over the South, and it practiced segregation. So the Communist Party was protesting it. Um, which is the right thing to do, obviously. They got a call from New York City. And the call was, oh, well, you need to stop protesting Sears uh, because they made a deal, uh, you know, the, we made a deal with the FBI to drop charges against the leaders of the party, uh, but you have to stop protesting Sears in exchange for the deal. Well, it was that was not a real phone call. That never happened. Um, if you read the book, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've read the book, but that phone call, that was false. That didn't happen. There was no deal. That was the FBI just called them up and pretending to be the leaders of the party said, oh, you know, you know, yes, as leaders of the party, we are telling you to stop protesting Sears. Right. It was just made up. Right. And that weird, the, 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 the amount of FBI infiltration the Communist Party experienced in the 1950s was massive. Um, and because of that, um, because of the huge amount of infiltration that was going on, they kicked out a lot of very good people on spurious charges of racism they they also did weird things like that. So, you know, there you go. There you go. Just thought I would mention that. Um, you can't compromise with wokeness. You can't. You can't. So there you go. 
Um, will Latinos ever be absorbed into white society or will they always be a minority? Well, here's a question, right? And I'm just throwing this out there. I'm just throwing this out there. Can one be white and Latino? I, I, I believe one can be white and Hispanic. Can one be white and Latino? I'm not the person to ask about this. I'm not. I'm just not, you know, because I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. And um, I just don't know. Um, so, I, you know, I, I wish I could answer your question uh, correctly. But, you know, I'm a white guy. My wife is Latino. But, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that question. Um, you know, generally when you take like surveys and all of that, they will ask you your race and then they'll ask you your ethnicity and it'll say Hispanic, non-Hispanic. Right. Um, so I mean, I, I, you know, you know, I, I, I just don't know, you know, and who am I to say what the identity of, of a Latino is? Uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know. You know what I mean? Um, I know I'm white and I will always be white and, uh, you know, I'm, I can't unwhite myself. Um, but what qualifies someone as Latino, I, I can't comment on. I really, I really do not know. I, I, you know, I'm just not, you know, I, I don't know what to say, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what more there is to say about it. Okay, uh, next question. Will uh, Do you see a difference between being anti-imperialist and anti-war? I see a lot of people being duped by propaganda being anti-war. Yeah, there's a big difference there. There are a lot of people that are anti-war uh, that are pacifists. Pacifism is a very big trend. Um, and actually, what's interesting, I mean, it's interesting isn't the right word for it, but... Um, I don't know if interesting is the right word. There are a lot of pacifists that are not leftists. And you wouldn't know that if you if you didn't, you know, if you didn't go looking for it. There are a lot of religious pacifists who are not left wing at all. They are not interested in socialism. They're not anti-imperialist. They just have a religious objection to war. Uh, I grew up in an area in Ohio where there were a lot of Mennonites. And those Mennonites, they voted Republican. Uh, you know, they were very conservative, uh, you know, but they were they they their religion forbid them to fight in wars. They were conscientious objectors. They would not fight in wars. And a lot of them, you know, they they even supported the U.S. invasion of Iraq and such. They just my church says I'm not allowed to be to fight, you know, and it was that simple. Um, and there's, a, there are, there are people that are anti, and there's, there's Catholic anti-war people that are like that. You know, they think, you know, the communists are evil. They support the United States. They believe in capitalism, but they also believe that it is immoral to engage in a war that the Pope has condemned military action. So they, you know, they, they take like a kind of pacifistic moral stance against war. Now, because of the fact that, you know, starting really in the 1950s, that communists made um, communists made uh, anti-war stuff their focus, a lot of pacifists eventually will absorb into their materials leftist stuff. Like they'll start talking about the military industrial complex. They'll take they'll they'll like absorb leftist talking points, kind of, um, but not always. Not always, especially some of the more devout folks, right? Some of those very, very conservative Mennonites, the guys are always wearing button down shirts and the girls are wearing skirts to their ankles. And, you know, on Sunday when the girls go to church, they have to wear those bonnets on their heads because the Bible says you can't, you know, you can't show your hair in a church. Those folks are not absorbing, absorbing anything socialist. Those folks are, you know, you know, they are. They are pacifists. They are anti-war. They are morally opposed to militarism of any kind. Uh, they encourage the U.S. government to win without war. They might even support wars. They just can't participate in them. But, you know, but there are others. And there's a sliding scale, too. There are a lot of pacifists that are like social Democrats. You know, the Catholic Worker Organization, right? That's Dorothy Day. They're like Christian socialist pacifists. And they're, you know, yeah, they're 
they're anti-imperialist, I would argue. They know that Western capitalism is the problem. They know that war is used to enforce Western capitalism. They're not really supportive of the forces that are against, that are on the other side, but they they have a kind of marxist understanding of why the war has happened. There's a sliding scale. There are many religious pacifists uh, that are, that are, you know, that are anti-imperialist, right? But there are many that aren't. And it's kind of a sliding scale, I would say, in my experience. It's been years since I've worked with those folks. But, you know, you know, um, it just depends, right? I mean, there's kind of a sliding scale. Um, and that, you know, anti-imperialist voices tend to be better organized and they tend to have a more coherent message. Um, you know, so, you know, but that said, you know, I mean, I, I remember when I was in high school, um, I would hear people say, I'm going to go to an anti-war rally and beat everybody up someday. I'd be like, why? And they'd be like, cause they're all against war. So if they punch back, they're hypocrites, you know, and people thought all anti-war activists were pacifists. Right. And I mean, that was I heard that from multiple people. They're just, you know, yeah, I'm going to go beat up anti-war protesters and they can't punch back. Ha ha ha. And they're also they're hypocrites. And it's like, well, what if they're communists? What if they support the Vietnamese people? What if they support the Iraqi resistance? Right. Um, you know, so there's there's ignorance. Ignorance abounds all around. Right. But um, but yeah, there are a lot of people that are anti-militarism. They're against militarism. They are pacifist in their orientation. And they're not really anti-imperialist. Um, you know, the American Friends Service Committee. Quakerism is totally in bed with the CIA. Ooh, that's a good question. You know, there's a lot of those folks with the American Friends Service Committee, Quakers that are, you know, they support every color revolution ever. Uh, they, you know, they are totally, you know, they totally, they buy the CNN interpretation of world events. They just don't like bombs. You know, they just don't like when the troops get sent in, um, you know, and uh, those folks exist. Um, so there you go. There you go. All right. Next question. Hamiltonian versus Jeffersonian worldview. Um, all right. So Alexander Hamilton was an economist. Uh, he was born in some islands, right? He wasn't born in um, he wasn't born in in the 13 colonies. He was born in where, like Trinidad or where? what island was he born in? Uh, where was Alexander Hamilton born? What island was it? He was born in some islands. Right. And as a young man, he was heavily involved in like doing business. Right. Um, he was involved in like doing business as a young man and overseeing exports and imports. Right. He was born in Nevis in the British Leeward Islands. OK, there we go. Um, you know, and, and he was an economist and he was very much into the idea that the state should build infrastructure. The state should build infrastructure in order to build a stronger economy. And the main project that Alexander Hamilton promoted after the American Revolution was the construction of lighthouses, right? Because the American Revolution, one of the main motivations had been taxation. So the idea they were going to impose taxes on everybody wasn't going to fly. Um, so the main way that the 13 colonies were able to make money was through ships, um, ships coming. And they had... They had tariffs, um, you know, taxes on imports and exports. And that was the way they made money because they couldn't tax the population because of the, you know, the American Revolution and they didn't like taxation. Um, and so he spent government money to build lighthouses up and down the East Coast so that those ships would be safer, uh, you know, when they when they arrived because lighthouses save lives. You know, back in the day of, you know, before electricity, when people are sailing on the ocean, Lighthouses are a matter of life and death. You know, if there's not a lighthouse, you might die. And if there is one, you might live. And lighthouses make sea travel much safer. Um, and so he had the government spend lots of money to build lighthouses. 
Uh, and he argued that the U.S. government should have a national bank uh, that would serve the purpose of building things that would stimulate economic growth. And that was Alexander Hamilton's economic thought. Um, and it was basically this notion that the state has an obligation to promote industrial expansion, uh, to promote technological innovation. And he argued for this. This was Hamilton, Hamilton's view. Jefferson, on the other hand, Jefferson was a settler populist. Uh, Jefferson was into the idea of, you know, what he called the yeoman. Uh, the yeoman was the small farmer who owned his own farm and uh, he didn't hire any laborers, right? He owned his own farm and he worked the land all by himself and he was a self-made man, right? And Jefferson talked endlessly about the yeoman, how America was a great country where a man could be a man and no one would mess with him. The yeoman was this idyllic notion of the yeoman. America is this frontier where we have these small farmers, these yeomen, and nobody messes with them. It was kind of libertarian stuff. However, many people have pointed out that Jefferson's rhetoric hailing the yeoman uh, was actually a way to protect the slave owners. Right? The slave owners, obviously, they weren't working the land by themselves. They owned a lot of slaves. But the policies that Jefferson implemented and promoted in the name of protecting the yeoman were really about enabling the slave owners to get away with what they wanted. Um, and that the other thing about Jefferson um, you know, was that he was very opposed to any notion of a national bank. And he was very opposed to the government spending money on infrastructure. He had very libertarian free market ideas about how the United States should operate. Um, you know, Hamilton was very, very opposed to slavery. Thomas Jefferson, interestingly, he claimed he was against slavery, but he, he had slaves his whole life. Um, and then, and he, he, you know, he had one that was his concubine, Sally Hemings, right? She was basically, he was raping her. She was his, you know, his sex slave or whatever. And, uh, had children with her and all kinds of things. But then uh, he claimed he was against slavery, though. He said slavery was wrong or whatever. Uh, and then um, and then when he died upon his death, he freed all of his slaves upon his death. Um, you know, which is, I mean, a little bit hypocritical. Right. Um, but he he, you know, in the name of the rights of man or whatever, he said he was opposed to slavery. But, you know, in practice, he practiced slavery uh, and then he freed them all when he died. Um, but his economic policies done in the name of the yeoman, you know, which were very libertarian, hands off. You know, he was for the small farmer. America is a great, vast territory of land where anyone can become a small farmer. You know, it was it sounded all nice, but it was really just, you know, a cover for supporting the slave owners. And Hamilton, a lot of people say, well, he was a Wall Street guy. He was for those Wall Street bankers. Well, I mean, yeah, he wanted the American economy to go better. He wanted there to be foreign investment. He wanted there to be international trade. But his focus was mobilizing the state to do it, right? Build a national bank, build lighthouses. His ideas were uh, very much uh, ideas that were about, you know, you know, the state taking responsibility for building a strong economy. He was not a free market guy. And then the decisive thing uh, that really puts Hamilton above Jefferson uh, was the Haitian Revolution. In Haiti, the slaves of Haiti broke their chains and they had a revolution. Hamilton supported it and he wanted the United States to have diplomatic relations with the slave revolutionary government of Haiti. Whereas I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Jefferson did not. Uh, he did not you know, respect uh, the slave revolution of Haiti. So ultimately... Uh, it's interesting because if you read material from the Communist Party in the 30s, even in the 60s, they would talk about the, quote, Hamiltonian counter-revolution, and they would recognize Jefferson as being the, the leader of the revolution, as being the, the more revolutionary figure. So much so that even in, the, um, even in the 60s, the Communist Party would have Jefferson bookstores. Did you know that? The Communist Party would have bookstores, and they'd be called Jefferson bookstores. Um, you know, after Thomas Jefferson, uh, and Earl Browder, um, I think I have some of Earl. Yeah. Earl Browder. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I have some of Earl Browder's writings here. This is the, the people's front and Earl Browder attacks Hamilton as like a wall street, you know, guy, uh, and he supports Jefferson. Um, and really I, I credit the LaRouche movement, uh, the, the Lyndon LaRouche people. They're the ones who really 
worked very, very hard to defend the legacy of Alexander Hamilton. But then Christian Parenti, the son of Michael Parenti, who's a professor in New York City, he wrote a Marxist book, Radical Hamilton. Um, and now, especially now that there's the musical Hamilton that was on Broadway, now overwhelmingly Marxists recognize that Hamilton was the revolutionary uh, and that Jefferson was the reactionary. But it took some time. It took some time. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's just that's that's a shift in opinion. Uh, that's a big shift in opinion that's come over years. Um, you know, it's come over the years uh, because, you know, there's been a shift. Um, and that, yeah, you know, I mean, the musical Hamilton doesn't really pay much attention to his economic policies. It focuses on him being against slavery. It focuses on him being exotic because he's from an island. And, you know, he's a poor person who worked his way up, et cetera. But the economics of Alexander Hamilton are what are important. And uh, the policies that he promoted were very, very important. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that I think the reason that the left liked, I think I'll just be honest with everybody. The reason that the left liked Jefferson, right? I mean, and, and even when I was in college, you know, I had a college professor who was like a, a leftist and he would, he would, he liked Jefferson and he called himself a Jeffersonian and he didn't like Hamilton. Um, part of the reason that, uh, that leftists liked Jefferson was because Jefferson was more or less an atheist. Um, and see all my life, I would hear the founding fathers of the United States were Christian. America is a Christian country. Well, that's actually not true, right? Thomas Jefferson was not a, not a Christian. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, he wrote the Jefferson Bible uh, and he took throughout the old Testament and he took all the miracles out of it. And he wrote the Bible without any miracles in it uh, and without any uh, without any Old Testament. And he said he was preserving the teachings of of Jesus for more enlightened times, uh, you know, and Thomas Jefferson, you know, he you know, he was very much a, uh, you know, a, a, an atheist. Uh, and I think a lot of leftists like that about him, that he was he was an atheist or a religious skeptic and. People liked that, that he owned a Quran, right? And that he was involved in Freemasonry, which Masonry, Freemasonry was a place for religious skeptics. You know, it, it's interesting to think about because it's like, right? Back in these days, you know, average people could not be religious skeptics. If you went around saying, you know, I'm not sure about this whole God thing, people would think, oh my God. And, you know, you might be burned at the stake or, you know, you would just, it was just a, oh my God, it was an awful thing. And, um, and masonry, Freemasonry was for educated folks, doctors, lawyers, and others. And it was a place that people that had been to university and studied and all of that, they would join this club and you would join this club and this club you'd join and they would gradually get to know you. And after you took one course, you'd learn one thing and then you'd learn another thing and then you'd learn another thing. And basically masonry is more or less, um, you know, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it atheism. They believe in God, but they believe in, you know, it's like a universalist kind of idea. There's truth in all religions you know, they have that symbol that is, um, you know, it's like the, the compass and square with a G in the middle and it stands for God and also stands for geometry because mathematics proves that God exists because there's order in the universe. And, you know, they read the Quran, they read the Bible, they compare them, they talk about the Catholic Church being this awful institution that held back science and the Enlightenment. And, you know, masonry was a place that, you know, kind of trusted elites could be religious skeptics uh you know um they don't talk about god they talk about the supreme being right they you know they you know and and that you know when you talk about the founding fathers of the united states a lot of them were like this right that they were not going around making atheistic statements all the time because that would have offended the common people the average people, you know, in New England, they were Puritans and Virginia. They were they were what were they in Virginia? I don't know. In Maryland, they were they were Roman Catholic. And, you know, I mean, it was just you couldn't do that, um, you know, but, uh, you know, but there, there was kind of, you know, you know, religious skepticism. And that it, it's also understood that the the founders of the United States, they were, you know, they were um they were socially liberal for the time, right? I mean, everyone knew Thomas Jefferson. He had his wife, but he also had his Sally Hemings, which is an, a reprehensible thing. I mean, you know, but 
you know, but in at the time it's like, Ooh, he's edgy, you know, you know, uh, you know, I mean that, that, you know, they were religious skeptics. They, you know, they were into mystical stuff. They studied paganism and they, you know, they were free thinking radicals, right. You know, and that's true, right. They were not, they were not conservative. You know what I mean? They were not, they were not conservative conformists. They were wealthy people who were very educated and explored forbidden ideas among themselves. And um, because my whole life and because in the United States, if you're around conservatives, you get spoon fed this idea. The founding fathers of the United States were all fundamental Baptists and, you know, believed in the six day creation. And that's why, you know, anyone who doesn't is un-American and needs to move to another country because of that. Um, you know, I think that that some leftists, when they learn that Jefferson was an atheist, when they learn that, you know, he was a nonconformist, et cetera, because of that, they 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 see themselves, especially like boomers, they see themselves as cultural liberals. Right. I believe. Who was it? Um, right. Don't they always bring up? Didn't George Washington grow marijuana? Is that true? Right. Or is that just like a hippie myth? Right. That George Washington grew marijuana. Like he had fields of marijuana or something. I, I don't even know if that one's true or not, but there you go. You know, there you go. But yeah, Hamilton was for industrial development. Now he was for a national bank. Uh, Jefferson was a libertarian and a settler populist who was in bed with the slave owners, even though he claimed to be against slavery while he practiced it. Uh, so there you go. There you go. All right. What did Lenin have to say about Eugene Debs? Good question. Vladimir Lenin liked Eugene Debs, and he wrote a very important essay um, about the 1912 presidential elections in the United States, where he talked about how um, the Bull Moose Party of Theodore Roosevelt was formed to take votes away from Debs. And Lenin praised Debs excessively. Uh, he knew about Debs. There's a volume. I used to have a copy of it. I don't know where if I have it anymore. Um, there was a copy of it that, uh, you know, that uh, that I had. It was called Lenin on the United States. It's a volume of like everything Lenin ever wrote about America. And in that book, uh, he there's several essays where he praises Eugene Debs uh, and he speaks very highly of Eugene Debs. He says that Eugene Debs praises him for being anti-war, praises him for running in the elections and getting so many votes. He speaks very highly of Eugene Debs. The other thing is Eugene Debs, before he went to prison, he gave a speech where he said that he was a Bolshevik. Um, now, later in his life, Eugene Debs was critical of the Russian Revolution, but he was in prison. The only people he had access to were people in the Socialist Party who had not joined the Communist Party. And so, you know, who knows if he had known the facts, what he would have said. But um, but it is interest, interesting that um, Eugene Debs, he did refer to himself as a Bolshevik um, at one point when they were putting him in jail. He said, you know, I'm a Bolshevik, he, he did say. And he expressed at least some sympathy for the Russian Revolution. So there you go. There you go. All right. Was Lenin responsible for the Romanov, for the execution of the Romanov family? And was it politically necessary to proceed with the execution? Um, my answer is, I don't know. And, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I, the conditions they were in, I probably don't have to tell you this gala, but for those who are listening, you know, the Russian civil war, 15 different countries invade. There's a white army that wants to restore the czar to the throne. There's famine and people are starving and medicine isn't getting into the country and there's the red army is fighting the white army and there's horrendous massacres being committed and you know did lenin directly order the execution of the romanov family i don't know um and under those circumstances did it make sense for him to do that i don't know you know um obviously the details of of what happened. I mean, the fact that, you know, these people were killed simply because they had Royal bloodline. That's not fair. That's, that's wrong. Um, it's not very appealing. I don't believe in the death penalty. Personally, it was up to me. We would get rid of the death penalty completely, but you know, the Bolsheviks in those early years, you know what else they did is they outlawed the drinking of alcohol. And did you know that, um, right after the Russian revolution, they outlawed the drinking of alcohol. They confiscated all the alcohol because people were having drinking parties and celebrating the revolution and they needed to have a military. 
and they outlawed the drinking of alcohol and they implemented the death penalty for drinking alcohol. So, you know, and they had to have enforced it at least once. And I cannot imagine in my entire life a situation where I would shoot somebody for drinking alcohol. That's awful. Can you imagine someone getting killed because they drank alcohol? That's awful. But apparently the Bolsheviks did that during the Russian Civil War because that was the circumstance they were in. They had to have this ironclad discipline because they were being invaded and attacked and millions of people died in the Russian Civil War and they were fighting for their lives. And under the, those kinds of circumstances, you know, I mean, we we just have to be thankful that we're not in the kind of circumstances to have to kind of make those decisions. And that's why I always tell people, as much as I, I study the Russian Revolution and all of that, we can't relate. We living in the United States, the center of imperialism that's been exploiting the rest of the world for 100, 200 years, and we can't relate. We can't relate. We just can't relate to it. Um, you know, Gavin says it was a local branch. I hope that's true, but, you know, I, I we can't relate. We can't relate. We don't know the circumstances that they were in, and we shouldn't try to copy what Lenin did. And we shouldn't try to copy what Stalin did. We shouldn't try to copy what they did because it doesn't apply. What we're trying to do in the United States now and what they did a hundred years ago in Russia is completely different. Different time, different circumstances, different culture, different history. The reason that I point to the Soviet Union, the reason that it's relevant to defend the Soviet Union, is because we have been told our whole lives that communism never worked, never achieved anything. We have to accept capitalism because, oh, every other system has failed. And when you look at the circumstances they were in in 1917 and where they were decades later when they raised millions of people out of poverty, they industrialized the whole country. They wiped out illiteracy. They electrified the country. They built huge universities. They, they, they were making some of the best films that had ever been made. They, they invented space travel. If you look at everything they accomplished, I mean, how they, they lifted that country up from nothing. And they made it a superpower, a superpower that was so strong it could withstand a Nazi attack. The Nazis through everything they had at the Soviet Union, killed so many people, and they still, they were able to repel that attack and rebuild their country into a superpower all over again. So many people lifted out of poverty. So many people brought into modern housing from, from living in rural huts. So many people given access to healthcare and education. So, many, so much rapid industrialization. The lives of millions and millions and millions and millions of people transformed. That's proof that we don't have to have capitalism. And that's proof that no, capitalism isn't the only system that works. No, socialism hasn't failed everywhere it's ever been tried. You can have a non-capitalist society where the banks and the factories and the centers of economic power are operating according to a central plan made for the good of society rather than for the private owners. You can have socialism. And that we must never budge on. We must be adamant that this is true, and we must never let them tell us that socialism doesn't work or socialism failed because it clearly achieved miracles in a very impoverished country, in a country that started out at a very low level. It achieved miracles, and it achieved those miracles under the gun of imperialism, facing economic blockades, facing treaties that wouldn't let them get high technology from the West, facing, you know, endless attacks and wars and barricades and blockade. What the Soviet Union achieved is so astounding. So astounding. And the fact that they deny that to us and they say, oh, well, it collapsed. It collapsed in 1991. So none of that counts. I mean, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't. They don't. Right. Or they say, oh, well, Stalin, there were gulags. So none of that counts. Really? Well, geez, you know, does America, does everything we've achieved, does it not count because of slavery? Uh, does it not count because of all the Native Americans? You know, no one says capitalism doesn't work because of all the Native Americans or the transatlantic slave trade. 
So if you're going to say socialism, oh, it doesn't work because of gulags or, oh, it doesn't work because Stalin executed some people or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, that is why that is why I defend the Soviet Union. That is why I defend the Soviet Union and that we must not let them let them tell us that socialism doesn't work. And that's why I defend China. That's why I defend Libya under Gaddafi. That's why I defend Cuba. That's why I defend North Korea is that that they say that their system is the end of history. There's a book, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, right? Where they say this is the final system. Capitalism is the end of history. No, it's not. And over the course of the 20th century, many countries industrialized and raised themselves out of poverty and performed real miracles for their people with socialism and with capitalism. Free market capitalism has kept many, many countries in horrendous conditions. Haiti, for example, where they're still using charcoal to heat their homes. You know, Guatemala, where there's whole regions where the people don't speak Spanish, they speak indigenous languages, they don't have running water, they don't have electricity. You know, Nigeria, at this point, it's the top oil exporting country in Africa, and their life expectancy is very low. Uh, illiteracy among the population is very high. We don't have to have capitalism. The Soviet Union is proof of that. China is proof of that, you know, so we must not budge an inch. But when people ask us, you know, was it right, you know, to execute the Romanovs? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And, you know, I don't believe in the death penalty. It was up to me. We would have a socialist society that had no death penalty. But I know that if the Bolsheviks had come to power in 1917 in the middle of that war and been like, you know what? We're not going to have a death penalty. They would have lost. Because they were up against people that really knew how to kill. You know, and when you're up against people who kill, then you got to kill. And that's why war is an ugly thing. And we cannot relate to the circumstances. We can't. And that that's why on some level, sometimes when American communists, they get into this mindset, they think they're Lenin. They think they're Trotsky. They think they're Stalin. No, you're not. No, you're not. You can't relate. You can't relate. You have no idea. You have absolutely no idea. None. I mean, you you have no idea what they were up against. You have no idea what you would have done under those circumstances. And yes, you know, maybe you would have done better. Maybe you wouldn't have been as heavy handed and harsh. Maybe you would have been more humane. Maybe you would have made better decisions about this or that policy. You, But you don't know that. And the fact that they still achieved so much, their achievements are astronomical. I'm constantly told they ne never worked. I mean, they just never accomplished anything. That's a lie. And it's such a lie. It's a great example of the big lie, right? Hitler, he talked about how in Mein Kampf, he said, you know, people, it's easier to convince people of big lies than little lies because everyone tells little lies. But if you tell a big lie, a big, huge lie that is so far from the truth, People will believe you because they'll have a hard time believing that someone could lie that much. And especially if the media pumps out that big lie, people will believe it because it would be just too much for them to comprehend that something that is just everywhere, that is just common knowledge could be false. Right? Well, what is common knowledge in the United States that somehow, somehow communism and socialism has never worked? That is, that is just false. It's utterly false. Well, that doesn't mean that we should try to glorify and say that everything was randy dandy in the Soviet Union because it wasn't. There were a lot of problems in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a very authoritarian place. People didn't have freedom of speech. People didn't have freedom of assembly. But under the circumstances they were in, it probably wouldn't have worked if they'd had it. Right? They were surrounded and under attack. Who killed Joseph Stalin? Well, I mean... Supposedly, he died of natural causes, right? There are some people who believe he was was killed. They were believed that it was some kind of assassination. Um, you know, there's different theories about the guards that night or whatever. I, I don't know enough about that. And I mean, for all based on everything that I've seen, it looks like natural causes. But there are many people who do believe. I mean, he was old at that point, um, you know. And. Yeah, you're right, Gala, and that's why we have to that's why we have to defend the Soviet Union. 
Um, so, you know, um, and people forget what the Soviet Union did for us. You know, the black freedom struggle in America, that was because of the Soviet Union. That was because after the Second World War, Stalin was talking about the oppression of black people in America. That was because of the fact that they took William L. Patterson to the United Nations and let him speak about we charge genocide. You know, this week, the Russians, they had uh, Dan Kovalik speak at the United Nations. I was watching that U.N. Security Council meeting. I got a big grin on my face. I like I love that guy. I never thought that I that Dan Kovalik would speak, would would address the United Nations. But he did. That's because of Russia. But, you know, they let William L. Patterson, they got a black man from America, a black communist, and they put him on the podium and in front of the whole world. William L. Patterson accused the U.S. government of genocide against black people. I will never forget the history article. I've told this story many times, but I, I just bears repeating. When I was in high school, I had a history teacher and he was really into reading the art, the newspaper archives from my small town. He was really into that. He would go and read, new, you know, dig up newspaper articles from the 50s, from the 60s, whatever. He found a newspaper article from my little town, Orville, Ohio. I'll never forget this. The headline was, take that, Uncle Joe. Take that, Uncle Joe. And it was all about the fact, all about the fact that a black family, the first black family had bought a house in my little town. And the article began with a quote from Stalin. And Stalin said, the way America treats black people proves that it is not truly democratic or something like that. And they said, that's not true. This black family just bought a house. And they had a picture of this black family. They interviewed the black family about how they would bought a house. And clearly Stalin's full of shit because America lets black people buy houses. So clearly there's no racism. Clearly, clearly Stalin's full of it. You read the article. It's it's amazing. It's it's utterly amazing that they are, you know, Amer this is 1950. America's on the defensive. No, we're not racist. And the headline, take that, Uncle Joe. It's got a picture of this black family out in front of their house. A black family has a house. So Stalin's wrong. Yeah. You know, that is, that's what Stalin did for the United States. The USA would never have had a space program if it wasn't for the Soviet Union. And that is true as well. You know, Sputnik, the Soviet Union did Sputnik and it scared the crap out of America. They they told everybody that Sputnik had nuclear bombs in it and they were going to shoot nuclear bombs at America from space. You know, it was ridiculous. They and they, you know, they and and the education, right? You know, and there was a lot of funding for education, you know, the all the student, you know, student grants and all the people who went to college in the 60s. They were freaked out. The Soviet Union had Sputnik. We can't let them get ahead. So they started funding and, you know, paying for a lot of Americans to go to college. Right. That that happened. Right. A lot of America. If you if you have relatives, if your parents were boomers and they went to college, there's a good chance that if it wasn't for the Soviet Union, that never would have happened. Never would have happened. You know, Social Security and the old folks collecting Social Security. Well, that was in the Communist Party's election platform in 1932. And it was in the Communist Party's election platform in 1936. And then they had the sit down strike wave in 1937. And then it was law. They passed it into law. So, you know, it was a communist party, the communist party, those those Russian agents, those Moscow agents, those tankies. They're the ones that got you your Social Security veterans benefits. Anyone any veterans get veterans benefits? Right. Well, look up something called the bonus army, the bonus march was organized by communists aligned with the Soviet Union. They occupied Washington, D.C., demanding the payment of ben veterans' benefits. And the army had to clear them out. Read about the Bonus Army of 1931, organized by communists, by people who liked Stalin, people who were getting money, getting paid by Stalin. You know? The Soviet Union really has benefited Americans. We would not have Social Security. We would not have veterans benefits. We definitely wouldn't have had a civil rights movement. It wasn't for the Soviet Union. So, you know, um, that's why I defend the Soviet Union. But I can recognize that maybe, you know, that execution you referred to, maybe that was, was wrong. Maybe that was immoral. Maybe that was unjust. Maybe that was something they really shouldn't have done. Right? I know the Russian Orthodox Church, they consider that to be a martyrdom. Right. They consider that, you know, because the Tsar Nicholas II, he wasn't just the uh, 
you know, he wasn't just the, the czar, the king. He was also like the pope. He was the head of the church. And they consider that to be a martyrdom. Right? They consider that to be a horrendous crime. Um, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of communists nowadays that are Russian Orthodox. Um, so wouldn't surprise me. There's a lot of communists that say doing that was horrendous. Shouldn't have been done. You know, uh, you know, we, we don't have to defend everything. We don't have to defend everything. We don't have to get down in the mud and get nitpicky about every detail about, you know, did this happen and did that happen? And that's why, you know, I like Grover for a lot of his work, but sometimes I lose, he loses me because he gets really into the nitty gritty of stuff. And I, I'm at the point where I'm just like, you know, I defend the Soviet Union for the huge accomplishments that they had, not just in their own country and around the world. And I, I, the nitty gritty stuff kind of loses me sometimes, you know, because, and if we get too into that, you know, if we get too into that nitty gritty, see, the thing is, and I will tell you this, they have worked really, really hard to try and convince people that we're the same as Holocaust deniers. They really work hard to convince people that if you say anything good about Stalin, if you say anything good about the Soviet Union, you're the same as people that say the Holocaust never happened. No, we're not. The Holocaust is one of the most well-documented events in human history. The Nazis were very proud of what they did. They rounded people up on the basis of their race, put them on trains, took them to places, and then gassed them to death. No one has ever accused the Soviet Union of doing anything like that, ever. You know, there were deportations during the war. They moved people around on the basis of their ethnicity, but they didn't gas them to death. Uh, and that was in the context of a war. They were moving people around on the basis of their nationality. You know, the gulags, most people who went to gulags got out after a year or two. Gulags were bad. A lot of people went to them who didn't belong there, but most people that went to gulags got out in a year or two. So that's not what happened. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just there's nothing that Stalin did that you can equate with the Holocaust, right? A bad, a bad agricultural policy, uh, you know, prison camps, you know, deporting people, moving people around on the basis of their population during the war. None of that is the same as rounding up people because they're Jews, taking them to places and gassing them to death because they're Jews. Stalin didn't do anything like that. And, uh, you know, and, and claiming he did is not defensible. Um, but they, they really have worked hard to try and equate communism with Nazism to say that all illiberalism is the same. And it's it's really unfortunate. So we do have a responsibility to defend the Soviet Union, to defend the history of the Second World War, to defend the history of Ukraine from the Nazi apologist regime that's in power there, that's tearing down World War II memorials. We have a responsibility. Uh, but there's no reason to, you know, there's no reason to get Comp, you know, get into the nitty gritty. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to get into over complicated detail because a lot of bad things happened in the Soviet Union, too, and great sacrifices were made and unjust things were done and good people suffered and good people were persecuted. That happens plenty in this society. But, you know, these things do happen. So, you know, there's no need to no need to get, you know, to get into the nitty gritty where they can trip you up. Right. Um, so don't don't. Don't play into their strategy of trying to equate us with Holocaust deniers because we're not right. The Holocaust is one of the most well-documented events in human history. And, um, you know, a famine, a bad agricultural policy is not the same as rounding up people on the basis of their race and gassing them to death. Um, so there you go. There you go. There you go. And I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Gala. It infuriates me as well. It's a thing people say without thinking. Stalin was worse than Hitler. How? How? You know, people just say this. They don't think about it. It's just, it's just part of the, the U.S. orthodoxy, right? It's just a thing that they say, you know. So there you go. There you go. All right, folks. Well, it's been fun. I'll be back tomorrow night. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend 
in the world today. Good night, everybody. Good night.